Welcome back to Dr. Sellers Educate. Go ahead and subscribe to this channel and click the bell if you haven't already. We are happy to support you on your journey towards NLN Certified Nurse Educator success. And our goal is that you will receive your credential and feel confident whenever you sit for the exam. If you have not already, head over to the NLN website. That's where you're going to find information about the exam. You want to make sure you print out that candidate handbook and that you are reviewing all of the elements that are included in that handbook, especially the detailed exam blueprint. That is the content that we use to guide us in the review sessions that we do here on YouTube, as well as those that we do in our live review and in our self-paced CNE, CNE Novice, and CNE CL review. If you have not been to our website, you can head there, and that is drsellerseducate.com. You'll find all of the resources available to you to support you on your journey. As we jump into our content for this session, we have heard you all loud and clear that there continues to be gap areas related to item analysis. Focusing on distractors for this segment is going to be really important as you continue to close your gaps. And we just want to remind you of three C's for successful exams because we know that it can take quite a bit of time to develop those valid and reliable exams. So we want to share those three C's that are pulled from the literature about what should be included in an exam to ensure that students are, first of all, knowledgeable about the content. And second of all, that we are confident in knowing that we have evaluated what students have learned and their comprehension levels based on the appropriate Bloom's taxonomy levels for that specific student. We're going to recap some of the key components around exam analysis, and then we will finish out on looking at PBI and distractors in those three C's. Validity. Let's first talk about the three different types, which are content, construct, and criterion. First, content validity is defined as evidence that gives us information about whether or not the exam has indeed evaluated content we expected it to. So that begins with the test development, uh, designing that solid exam blueprint that's going to align with the objectives as well as Bloom's taxonomy levels. The second type of validity is construct. This allows students to be tested on and apply concepts associated with a specific, a specific skill or process. An example of a construct question could be about sterile technique, where we would expect students to be able to talk about the process steps and the skills associated with that specific procedure. The third type of validity is criterion. This type of question or exam is going to allow us to determine the degree between the test performance of that student and future performance, such as the NCLEX exam. So that's a recap of validity, what those three elements are and why they are important as we continue to determine whether or not students have actually learned the content that we expected them to. Our second type of exam analysis is going to include reliability. Is the trust, test trustworthy? Can it be reproduced? Does it consistently measure the knowledge that we expected to semester over semester with the same level of students? We wanna keep you encouraged as you stay focused on your journey to achieve success. So just remember, if you can dream it, if you have the courage to take action and have the discipline to stay on the right path, you will make it, you will be successful. There are certainly steps you need to take on your journey to ensure you are closing those gaps, that you have a solid foundation with your nurse educator experience that's gonna equip you with the important skills and knowledge that you have to be confident when you sit for the exam that you know the correct answer and that you have done your work in closing the gaps as part of this process as well. Item discrimination is an important component of conducting an item analysis, and this can be tricky for some, so we want to break it down a little bit. Remember that the point by serial index or the PBI really tells the story about how items discriminate between the high performing and low performing students. It can be a positive number or negative number. If we see a positive number, that's going to indicate that more students in that high scoring group or those students that scored very well on the test answered that question correctly. Okay, and then negative 
is going to indicate that low scoring students actually select, selected the correct answer more frequently than the high scoring students. And we would know that generally speaking, that would be a red flag and something we would want to investigate further. Which also leads me to a great point before we move on. Remember that there's a qualitative component to completing an, an exam analysis and an item analysis, as well as a quantitative. Now we're talking mostly about the quantitative right now, um, but remember you want to spend the time looking at the exam overall. So you wanna take a deep dive like we're doing right now. That's an important step in the process, but you also wanna just sit back and take a an general overview of and do a general overview of exactly what the exam tells you about the students given the high performing and low performing students and kind of where they scored on this exam in comparison even to other exams in your course. So just keep that in mind as well. And then the other important reminder is what that PBI range is, which we're gonna take a look at the chart to break it down a little bit more. It's gonna be between a negative 1.0 and a positive 1.0. If a PBI is less than 0.15, it should be revised. You will find some literature sources that actually cite a 0 0.20. But for purposes of our review, just remember that generally speaking, if it's between a 0.15 or 0.20, you probably want to revise it because our goal is that it will be greater than 0 0.30. That's going to indicate that it's an acceptable or good value for us to feel confident that we are discriminating between those low performing students and the high performing students on that specific exam question. These are the ranges that you will see cited in McDonald's text. This is an excellent resource for you if you are needing to close more gaps in understanding item analysis and what all these numbers mean. If it's greater than a 0 0.40, it's very good. You can see here that good is still within that range of 0 0.30 to 0 0.39, but we should examine STEM and options to clarify. We just again wanna ensure that we are developing solid exam questions and that we feel good about a confident exam to measure learning with our students. It's gonna be marginal if we hit that 0.20 to 0.29, we wanna identify problems with STEMs or our options, which we will talk about shortly. If it's 0.10 to 0.19, it's considered to be a weak question and we wanna revise either the STEMs or the options. It's 0.15, or less than 0.15, and some say less than 0.20, it should be restructured. We want to consider um, anywhere between here that we should, we want to consider revising the STEM or the options. And then if it's 0 to 0.10, it's very weak, we should consider rejecting. If it's less than 0, it's unacceptable, we should revise that question and reject it or accept multiple answers. As we talk more about conducting this item analysis, we want to clarify some key components associated with the distractor, okay? First is the definition. If it's a negative number, test takers scored lower on the exam, selected the distractor. And that's what we want, right? Because that is indication that students aren't knowledgeable about that content area. If it's a positive, if the distractor is positive, then test takers who scored higher on the exam actually selected the distractor, okay? And that's not a good indication that learning has happened, right? Because we would expect students who scored higher to not select the distractor. We want them to select the correct answer. Let's break that down a little bit more, okay? So stay with me. I know this can be confusing, so I wanna make sure that you all are still with me. I'm just gonna come on camera. All right, so now let's, dig a little bit deeper, provide more clarification regarding this distractor that we're talking about or the incorrect answers. A negative PBI is gonna indicate that the distractor has done its job, right? We've distracted our learners with incorrect, the incorrect option because they've chosen um, uh, one of the incorrect options. And this is just for a four option question, okay, that we're talking about right now. We're not talking about, um, the select all that apply. You can certainly use this evaluation when you look at distractors for select all that apply. 
Uh, but for purposes of this example that I'm talking about, just to not confuse you all, we're talking about a four option question, okay? So a negative PBI indicates an effective distractor like we talked about. Effective distractors are gonna attract the test taker who does not know the content, right? We want them to select the incorrect answer. A positive PBI is going to indicate that students scoring well are selecting the distractor instead of the correct answer. That is not what we expect. We would expect students that perform well on the exam to choose the correct answer. If we have four options in the question and we have a PBI of zero, that is not a good option. We want each option to be chosen by our Ideally, our low performing students, that's going to indicate to us that indeed it was an effective distractor. All right, so let's take a test. Um, I've talked a lot, so let's see kind of how these concepts land for you. This is a short quiz for you that I want you to take right now. So let me explain this to you to kind of level set and help you understand what the activity is. So the correct answer is D for this specific example. You see here that we have the test item options. Again, D is correct. And you see this next column is a point by serial index. So this tells you the number as well as if it's negative or positive. And what you are doing is you're going to determine what the level of discrimination is. These are your options. Okay, so for number one, test takers who scored lower on the exam selected the distractor. You would place this in one of the boxes over here to the right. It, and it's based on the number that your PBI is, is indicated on this spreadsheet. The second option that you will match, this is a matching game to either A, B, C, or D, is based on the choice that gives you information from the PBI that there's poor discrimination and no one selected this distractor. The other um, two options that you have to match with A, B, C, and D. Number three is that test takers who scored higher on the exam selected the correct answer. And then you have number four here, the test takers who scored higher on the exam selected the distractor. It requires revision. Again, you're going to choose one, two, three, or four to match with A, B, C, or D. And I will allow you to go ahead and pause here and then come back when you're ready. All right, so how did you do? Is it confusing? Do you feel overwhelmed? Well, I don't want you to feel that way. And we actually have a boot camp that's available to help you dig deeper in this content area. Um, and we will continue to do that because we know, again, many of you are confused when it comes to how do we evaluate distractors? What does PBI mean? Because sometimes it can seem to be um, opposite in your analysis. Okay, so let's dig deeper into this specific example. For A, if you chose number two, you are correct because we have a PBI of zero, which means it, it, it shows poor discrimination because nobody chose it. Remember, we want all of the distractors to be chosen by some of our students, right? Because that's gonna indicate to us that it was a good distractor, but no one selected A, so we would want to do what to that question, that option. That's right, if you said revise it, that is correct. We would want to choose a different option so that it can distract at least one or a couple of our students. And then for option B, if you match number one, test takers who scored lower on the exam selected the distractor, you are correct because it is a negative number. It is a negative PBI, right? And what does the negative PBI tell us? If you want to go back here, a negative PBI indicates an effective distractor. Effective distractors attract the test taker who does not know the content well to select the incorrect answer, all right? So B, um, negative 0.20, it was a distractor, right? Because the correct answer is D. So test takers who scored lower on the exam selected this distractor, which is what we expected, right? And that means that's a good option as a distractor. All right, so now let's look at C. If you matched it with number four, test takers who scored higher on the exam selected the distractor, requires revision, you are correct, okay? Because it's a positive number and it's 0.25. This means, going back, if you wanna look at the table again, 
A positive PBI indicates that students scoring well are selecting the distractor instead of the correct answer. And that is not what we want, correct? So even though when you look at the table, the PBI um, was 0.25, which was a good option, if it is the correct option, right? So remember that when we looked at the table of the ranges here, it said that 0.20 to 0.29 was a good range, correct? And you're right. But remember, this is for correct answers, okay? This is not for distractors. You can use the PBI for distractors, but what it's gonna tell you is truly just the percentage of students that shows that option, okay? So there are a couple of elements that you wanna consider when you are looking at an example like this. And this is why we're taking the time to break this down a little bit further. And then for D, if you chose number three, you are correct. Test takers who scored higher on the exam selected the correct answer, right? Because we have a positive number for this correct one. And then we have 0.33 for the PBI. And we know that is a, a good range, right? Because it's point, it's greater than 0 0.30. Exceptional or very good would be 0 0.40. All right, so I hope that didn't cause you too much confusion. And we hope that that clarified some key components related to item discrimination and distractor. And we're gonna wrap up now. I thank you for watching this episode, but we're gonna wrap up with, um, just as a reminder, those three components that we talked about earlier that are gonna help you ensure that you are creating exams that are going to be valid and reliable and be successful as you seek to discern really students' performance from these exam scores. So the three C's that we wanna focus on are gonna include content. So making sure that we have reviewed content with our students that is aligned with these exam questions. The second C is gonna be clarity. Ensure that we're writing very clear exam questions. And then third C is going to be critique. So making sure that we're critiquing the exams and the item questions as part of our item analysis process to ensure that we are providing that quality exam question for our students that's gonna validate learning. All of these components are aligned with the NCLEX exam, and it's important for us to make sure that we are writing um, well-developed questions that are gonna test learning with our students. All right, so we are excited that you are continuing your journey, and we hope to see you in an event soon. We will have more upcoming workshops that we will be releasing that announcement about very soon, and we appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next time.